Welcome everyone to the 12th webinar of the KCHR webinar series. Uh, we will have a five or six, five, ten minutes delay in the starting of the webinar as the chairperson of the session is uh, just reaching uh, Patanam from where he'll be attending the webinar. Uh, before we start, let, you, let me use this time to announce our next webinar of the series, which is on 13th, um, sorry, 10th of December by Dr. Mahmood Kuria on Matrilineal Ocean, Multiple Histories of Marimakatayam in the Indian Ocean. I request all of you to uh, kindly wait for five more minutes and we will start with the proceedings. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Shall we begin with the proceedings, sir? Yes, we can. We can. Okay. Welcome, everyone, to the 12th webinar of the KCHR webinar series on assets of money, commercialization, and land ownership in Malabar Coast Some Observations on the Late 18th Century by Dr. Abhilash Mane. I request all of you to kindly put your microphones on mute. Once the speaker finishes the presentation, you are requested to type in your queries and comments in the chat box, which will be read out for the speaker. I request Professor P.K. Michael Karagan, Chairperson KCHR, to please take over the proceedings. Um, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm sorry that I was a bit late. Um, I particularly welcome Abhilash Malil to this uh, gathering. Uh, I've been um, listening to him at a couple of other places too. And I should say that um, he is one of the young scholars who have been highly impressive in his uh, uh, postulations, particularly his, uh, uh, I would say, even an alternate hypothesis about commercialization in the Malabar region. Um, many uh, others, including, of course, uh, myself, uh, try to argue that the commercialization in Malabar was not as uh, um, as evolved as it was in southern Kerala. Uh, but um, the feeling I get reading Abhilakut's work uh, works is that he has got evidences to suggest the opposite. Um, anyway, it's a very interesting hypothesis that he's been uh, putting forward and a very strong hypothesis too. Uh, now we get a chance to to listen to him directly and uh, we are all happy that you took the trouble and uh, spared the time to, to address the report of webinar series. And I also uh, would uh, like to welcome all of you for having come. And um, um, we would um, um, uh, get more opportunities for this kind of uh, engagements um, in the future, too. And so welcome, everybody, on behalf of the KCHR and on my own behalf. I would. Um, I won't delay the presentation. I would request Abhilash Malin to start his, uh, his talk. Hello. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Professor Michael Karagan, sir, for this, for his generous uh, uh, introduction and appreciation of my 
otherwise humble work um i i consider uh, my elementary enterprise of researching with uh, late 18th and early 19th century material as a as a minor continuation of uh, the work um, uh, uh, commissioned by uh, scholars like michael karagan and um, and dr priyan ganesh and having said so um, uh, um i am extremely happy uh, about this uh, this rare opportunity of uh, presenting my work uh, before an audience who are specialized uh, or who have a specialist interest in the domain of economic history of early early modern kerala 18th and early 19th century kerala and um, thanks a lot for for giving me this opportunity for my friend rachel who is a research uh, officer at um, rachel evergi is a research officer at uh, kchr and also many others i have seen uh, many of my friends my teachers uh, my comrades and my acquaintances in the in the list of uh, people who are present there uh, i thank uh, them all and um, let us start with uh, my presentation so this is actually a a part of a draft today's presentation is part of a draft or a early presentation which i have um, uh, uh, given um, at a workshop an economic history workshop organized a couple of years back at kodungallur uh, by my research group neem um, of hebrew university of jerusalem where i had uh, the opportunity of celebrating some of my or reflecting upon some of the things some of the economic history aspects of the late 18th century uh, so this is a part of that presentation and um, and so let us uh, let us begin with my presentation so i am sharing my um, my 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 desk desktop with you and uh, i think it's uh, you you can see yeah, you all are able to see um my 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 screen i suppose uh, not now is that you yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll 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 try again i'll try okay. again yeah uh, uh, rachel do you have my uh, ppt with you can you please share it uh, Yes, sure. We will do that. Please, please, yeah. Just give us a moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah Shall we yeah. go to the first slide? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the second slide. The second slide okay. where. Oh, please, yes. so we uh, i invite all of your attention to the second slide which is now presenting by the kchr and here there's a quote by thomas munro i'll start we will start reading with that quote and uh, this appears in munro's uh, minute very famous minute which is often cited by many scholars and we'll start reading that uh, we proceed in a country in which we know little or nothing as if we know everything um as if everything to be done now and nothing could be done hereafter instead of seeking to remedy by acquiring more knowledge we endeavor to get rid of the difficulty by precipitating uh, making uh, precipitately making permanent settlements uh, which relieve us from the troublesome task of minute investigation the quotation uh, is an off cited statement of the english east india company's revenue administrator Uh, Thomas Munro. Um, uh, it first appeared in his minute of December 1824, titled "State of the Country and the Condition of the People," which was an important document explaining, almost like an official uh, manifesto, the historical premises and the future prospects of the Rajwari settlement and its magistracy in the Presidency of Madras. the minute had an intimate connect, uh, uh, connection with the west coast of the presidency that is on the collectorates of malabar and canara and also on their respective balagat appendages extending from vayanad in the south to sonda in the north in munro surprisal it was in this it was in this lengthy stretch of monsoon fed agrarian territory 
that the institution of landed property had surfaced early on from the remote period indeed by circa 1800 when Munro was a settlement officer for the revenue affairs in Canara, he saw that its existence, landed property's existence, had already became a universal, in quote, phenomenon. All varieties of land, here I quote Munro, whether cultivated, vacant, or that formed a timber forest, whether the crop is abandoned or scanty, yielded a fixed rent to their owners, either in money or in kind, or in both, unquote. The continuity of yielding such a rental income from the landed assets, according to Munro, was an important reason for the continuation of property in land and saleable ownership thereof. And in this regard, and in this regard, the West Coast in general and the ceded province of Malabar in particular was a great was at a great variance with the with the Coromandel coast. In Malabar, the monsoon, monsoonal rainfall enabled the cultivator to construct, to conduct his, his, his regular operations without taking or receiving any help, either hydraulic or fiscal, from the state. And instead made him depend upon, here I quote Munro again, uh, uh, upon his own industry for success and to venture to employ all his savings in the improvement of his land. Such a long-term operation of the landholders agency had disassociated. This is my first argument. Uh, such a long-term operation of landholders agency had disassociated the state and its functionaries from the agrarian operations. And in Malabar, no, regu no regular land revenue had been levied from, from prospective stakeholders. This is attested, this is repeatedly um, attested by, by from Tufatul Mujahideen to Thomas Munro. Uh, my friend Mahmoud would be speaking, uh, or Mahmoud has more to say about this, this aspect from uh, Arab Persian Shafi legal perspective. Um, as a result, the West Coast riot, unlike his East Coast Eastern counterparts in the Tamil district of Arcot, Tanjur, and Baramahal, uh, here I quote Munro again, has been enabled to render his land a valuable private property at all times and transferable at will. The private character of West Coast landed property, and in particular, the amount of money capital invested in it, were instrumental, this is my second argument, in giving birth to a complex mess of disputes about proprietary estates in the district of Canara and Malabar. Something in which, uh, something which in Monroe's acquaintance was almost unknown, almost unknown in the Coromandel side. In his all-time favorite, um, uh, collectorate of Bara Mahal, um, not one complaint in hundred was about property in land. This is a quotation of Munro. Uh, but here in the West Coast of Canada, nine out of ten are about the subject. Unquote. The neighboring district of Malabar was not left far behind. In 1815, when the earlier civil court statistics were published from the Sadar Adalat of Madras, uh, the district that Malabar, Malabar province, had 5,754 newly registered property suits and 1,691 pending cases. And the collectorate of Canara um, um, had 4,874 cases in its civil backlog. Almost uh, amongst uh, Madras Raithwadi district, Malabar ranked second, trailed only by the district of Bellari, which it is interesting to note was another professional domain of Munro. It is quite probable that this officer, Munro, had deployed some of its West Coast insight and empiricism into the Cedar district of, Bella, of which Bellari was a part. If his description of the Mutadari estates uh, and the credit re receiving riots of Baramahal uh, 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 was uh, form any clue. In other words, uh, this is my third argument, what Munro related from the early 19th century West Coast was probably a blueprint for, or rather a prehistory of the future development of, the, of a riotuary ethic, which if, if, if you could agree with me, uh, with Dharma Kumar's uh, opinion, uh, was the riotuary ethic was meant to widen the market in land and to encourage the riots to improve it and to look it on as if it was their permanent hereditary property, unquote. However, this West Coast 
or the uh, however this west coast effect or the implication of malabar and its mode of agrarian property in the so called mandro system have hitherto remained unexamined the immediate histories of raitwari arrangement was primarily investigated in coromandel world of mirasi and kaniyachi rights and subsequently with bertestein's intellectual biography of mandro and the kubada the fiscalism of mysore these investigations including the works of professor sanjay subramanyam on wadayar mysore and maratha tanjore often remind us uh, uh, often remind us of and seem to be carrying forward an important debate in the early 19th century madras which was centered uh, around raitwari practice and its historiographic assumptions though initiated in the practical context of a specific revenue collection policy of the company government this debate like the resolution that came out of it even if it was about a localized plot of purambok uh, or a piece of a privileged so called privileged privileged land holding was inseparable this argue bhavani raman recently uh, inseparable from the east coast uh, east india company scheme of political rule and sovereignty does the debate eventually does the debate eventually went into a deeper domain laying beyond a uh, mere bureaucratic administration of uh, revenue collection it touched upon this it touched apparently insoluble issues such as the societal roles of two major historical institutions that is state and private property it also gave birth to among an elite circle of participants divided intellectual opinions this division of opinion in madras between mandro and the group who opposed mandro was potent enough to exert a long standing effect not only on civil acts of policy making in the presidency but perhaps more importantly in deciding popular and even historiographic responses towards them as uh, one of the major architects of raitwari revenue scheme mandro was the chief proponent of the party which professed despite his overt and perhaps better known sympathy towards the institutes of paternalist conservatism conservatism of burkean kind a typical uh, utilitarianist position here i quote eric stock on the issue of landed property in all other matters of legal and jurisprudential intervention mandro was often equated with the burkean party but in the in the realm of landed property um uh, his his opinion was more or like similar to the typical utilitarianist position mandro's minute of december 1824 and the west coast observations that it carried stand as a best testimony for this peculiar disposition in the meantime the leading figure um amongst the critics of mandro uh, of his scheme of raitwari and by extension his idea of southern indian private property was the madras collector and polyglot in the file uh, f w francis white ellis ellis were more interested in the ancient traditions and treatises of landed property than in than in contemporary or even recent historical practice in his view there was no landed property alienable by sale in the whole of tamil country nor was the distribution of such property permitted outside of a given at times a remembered structure of royal land grant according to ellis um um a um, uh, 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 royal land grant or of a coparsonary group of hindu mirasidars the opportunity of land ownership here i quote ellis the opportunity of land ownership according to ellis and his adherents was restricted for the last millennia to as to the sedentary community of vellalar shareholders in their who lived in their time immemorial villages unquote it is therefore impossible uh, 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 for any person except those who belong to this commensal union to have a share in the product of the land unquote it is not our intention to jump deep into mandroilis divide and its political implications suffice to underline here an erstwhile unnoticed an erstwhile unnoticed convergence between the contesting parties of mandro and ellis i call this as malabar consensus interestingly this was a common point of agreement about the economic character of landed property and tenure along the west coast in particular in the district of malabar So, uh, uh, on this count, Ellis had little hesitation in agreeing with conclusions of Munro and its intellectual followers. Both of them consented that there is no Mirasi type. There is no Mirasi type that is nucleated and shareholder-based villages in Malabar. 
and consequently i quote a list there is no right of any kind in common access there in land and as a result all families reside apart on their own estate and possess their genmum or the property right in their own privatized account here i again quote uh, uh, a list Uh, uh, all families uh, uh, possess their own genmum or proprietor right in their own privatized account, free of all participation and control by the state. And formally, before the before the commencement of the rule by English East India Company, the company Sarkari, free of all rent. It was in this non-common. It was in this non-common, more precisely, egotistic and formally uh, egotistic scenario of landed opportunities in Malabar that at least so the possession of land has passed from the proprietary janmakars to under tenants of various descriptions. And these under tenants, according to him, notwithstanding their nominal and acknowledgement of Janmakkar superiority, were different from the subordinate tenantry uh, in the Tamil Mirasi setup. um uh, this was the, what was the major difference this was the major difference was their right to pay from the land they possess and control and from which they had made agrarian profits the burden of government tax such a right or opportunity during the mysore and the mandroist phases of rayatwari represented the ownership in the fiscal preview of state if not a valid claim on to it Ellis also knew about the existence in Malabar of some tenures of property tenures by property mortgage. This is very important, uh, where the tenants had the position of user factory mortgages. They did not pay to the Janma Kar any Swami Bhogam or the acknowledgement of superiority. This is because this is critical. Uh, this is unlikely. This is this is this is not as expected from a person like Ellis. Uh, but uh, they did not pay the the tenants did not pay any Swami Bhogam or acknowledgement of uh, of uh, of the of uh, of janmakar superiority this is because the whole profit the whole profit from land was being absorbed by the interest of the sum of money that janmakar had borrowed from his tenants who functions like a mortgage Ellis recognition of mortgage, especially a mortgage's potential to set up a lien claim against the traditional land ownership, and thereby engross whatever material benefits were left to a Malabar birthright holder, is surprisingly close to the discovery of Munro and his trusted revenue experts, uh, uh, such as William Thackeray. Needless to say, this position is nowhere in agreement uh, with Ellis' well-known commitment to the tenurial stability and monopolized land ownership. Equally important is his opinion on the vexed issue of sale events in the pre 19th century landed property. In his popular uh, replies to the 17 questions, Ellis agreed that in the province of Malabar, alienation or the final conveyance of land by sale and purchase used to take place, uh, uh, and it was here I quote a constant practice unquote. But according to him, in order to render such transfers valid and standing, here I quote: the consent or at least the knowledge of the king is necessary in making such an uh, unquote in making such an important attestation in agreement with Munro's party. Ellis seemed to have taken, I believe, clues from an early stratum of investigations on this region by market-minded, so-called market-minded Bombay uh, servants such as Robert Ricketts and Alexander Walker. perhaps because of uh, his wish i think uh, to underline and preserve the native elite privileges um, uh, especially the landed privilege elites did not elaborate further upon this issue of property alienation as we shall argue in the course of this presentation alienation of landed assets formed one of the means probably the most conspicuous medium um um uh, during the 18th century of affecting changes in a given structure of privilege Uh, uh, befitting his orientalist inclination uh, we see ellis citing a stanza from the malayalam treatise of law the 18th century composition vyavahara samudram uh, which describes the sale of janmam property in land in the clearest possible terms he added that malabar forms a province where the property right is better defined than in any other part of india Mandro and Thackeray, based on their finding, the famous fifth report had already travelled a step ahead in this direction, and had even drawn parallels between the situation or situation and history of landed property on the west coast and that of their home country, the Britain. 
uh, this presentation will approach the issue of convergence and also the comparisons and parallels that emerge from it as an important theme worthy of a fresh, uh, but to borrow a phrase from Monroe's uh, opening statement, a troublesome task of minute investigation. Such attempts had often been set aside in historiography, in particular in the writing about the land tenure of, of the Malabar court. The Malabar cost. The setting aside was in favor of a permanent settlement, which uh, compels historians to conclude, often at the cost of evidences pointing on the contrary direction that landed property and privatized rights therein were a colonial construct, an inventional and intentional creation of the British conquest and its technicalities of rule. The light of new evidence on land and revenue transactions during the late 19th and the early 20th centuries, this present presentation would like you to keep the following questions uh, for consideration. And what were the factors? What were the factors operating in the immediate background of the Monroe Ellis Agreement or the so-called Malabar Consensus or Malabar Consensus about the landed tenures of Malabar and Canara? Uh, why did these West Coast districts figure as ideal sites to anticipate, especially during the early part of the 19th century, a futuristic so-called rule of property for the Mad presidency of Madras? Uh, in other words, why did Lionel Place, uh, Jagir of Chingalpet, uh, or Alexander Reed's collectorate of Baramahal did not become successful in providing such a common site for convergence and positive conclusions. This is notwithstanding the fact that both Chengalpet and Baramahal, both Chengalpet and Baramahal witnessed an earlier course of East India Company revenue investigations on a much more extensive scale uh, than what happened in the coast of Malabar, along the coast of Malabar, which were intended, it, uh, as it is often alleged, uh, to mold, here I quote, to mold their historical tenures on land to the contours of British history. This is a famous quotation from Ranajit Guha, Rule of Property. Uh, and, and, and a recent, second, another case, and a recent specimen of scholarship in the early modern economic historiography, which describes from these places, from Coromandel, you can remember, you may remember President Parthasarathy and others, also Brand J. Morton and others, um, uh, um, um, of course, Tukasa, Sukasa, Mishusima, and others, um, um, and a new specimen of historiography which describes from these places intensive episodes of systemic, systemic activity in the realms of trade and craft production and in creating agrarian assets and in their attendant social effects. In addressing this question, I will limit my di this, this discussion mainly to the province of Malabar, which was ceded to the East India Company government in 1972 after the peace treaties of Sri Lanka Patana. It will occasionally make, make references to the territories of Cochin and Canara and assume that they too share a similar grid of land tenure and transaction. Before we proceed, it is important to clarify what is meant here by the term, as Professor uh, 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 Michael Terahan has pointed out earlier, what is meant by commercialization and how it related to the Malabar economy of the 18th century. I think commercialization um, um, to relate a political economy in which a significant part of production is sold in and a portion of its uh, consumption basket is brought from the market. Let us briefly look at the cases of paddy grain and pepper in Malabar. It's paddy field having had the capacity of producing rice only about 46 percentage. Here I quote from an important statistical register uh, printed for the collectorate of Malabar in 60, 1864 by Caleb Nayadu. According to that statistical evidence, the Malabar was producing rice, on, rice for only about 46 percentage of its resident population. And Malabar always depended for its regular rice consumption on external grain market, part of which was shipped in from Canara and Kurk, and the rest from the places as far as Orissa and Bengal. It was this home deficiency in the basic subsistence staple that made the market, especially the gray market uh, and the grain component in wages, a completely integrated institution in the Malabar environment. Amongst these, these regions, agrarian produce, pepper was the most conspicuous for its long-term market orientation. Uh, we need no introduction for this. As early as the 16th century, Jan Kennewitz saw the roots of pepper representing only the only stable and extra political network in Malabar. This was seemingly because their intimate connection with cultivators' subsistence in a grain deficient situation. 
uh, in his opinion with with which i have some reservations um, in his opinion deficiency in grain was one of the certain conditions leading to continual expansion of the pepper gardens and the money from its market from its market sale was necessarily primarily for the for the purchase of the food such was the immediate scenario such was the structural scenario uh, of the market dependency in this in this region uh, munro ellis consensus was reached uh, over this scenario and as we shall argue this consensus had a close correspondent with the 18th century practices in the realm of west coast landed property as profiled in the munro ellis consensus the class of agrarian proprietors in malabar was known by the term janmakarar or janmi who wield the right of janmam or akkipper janma represented a pan malabar birthright in landed assets it was frequently expressed in terms this is my fifth argument and uh, landed assets this was frequently expressed in terms of an allodial type of ownership and often counted similar to a miras without land tax contrary to the best historiographic expectation about the genesis of its landed rights mostly from the adherents and followers of william logan both native and foreign um, genesis of its landed right current among the madras right to the intelligentsia the janma was not remembered in malabar janma was not remembered in malabar by its claimants till the mid 19th century as a political endowment conditional upon one's rendering service military menial or otherwise uh, to a ruling king or a jajmani like system of village prostration even when it was exerted on an inaccessible inaccessible cardamom plot an, an uncultivable piece of timber forest or on a deserted sweden hillock the janmam right or rather the opportunity of possession that it entailed was always considered to be as private legal and heritable as the kingly prerogative of household rule and the king taking revenue from the cherical or the crown property it was unlike the the kurgi tenure named jamma and the malabar janmam holder did not usually consider himself under the obligation of service that is of supporting raja or helping to defray the expenses of raja's establishment from the produce of his janmam land thus in a broader 18th century parlance or in a broader 18th century sense he was the janmam holder was a lord permanent lord paramount janmason of the vyavaharamara parlance of his atipero freehold even though here i quote munro this estate was so small as to produce hardly a rupee a year hardly a rupee a year as its rent unquote his property status and the economic relationship that obtained for him was almost similar to that of a raja in his cherical demands in other words this is my sixth argument in other words at atiperu and the cherical properties maintained a close gentry affinity uh, towards each other both of them claimed the ground rent or partum from a subordinate class of occupants uh, differing only in the magnitude of their respective rents there was a tendency here i quote i depend entirely upon the works of professor keshavan veluthat uh, here uh, there was a tendency uh, um, uh, towards uh, territorial proliferation uh, of janmam proprietorship as early as late chera times uh, circa 13, 12 and 13th centuries this multiplication of non corporate and at times parvenu janmam holders of sudra population owed its development initially to a complex set of user factory tenures keshavan professor keshavan call it as uh, eed a user factory tenures by four crossable mortgage uh, and later especially after the 16th century the distribution of janmam holdings was cased by instances of janmam sale and purchase in both cases that is in mortgage and sale the achievement of user factory rights in land and the final transfer of landed proprietorship was facilitated by a necessary payment of value in the since the 16th century the value of landed assets was increasingly calculated through the medium of cash metallic money of, of, of gold or of bullion in general and occasionally through its grain equivalent in the context of property mortgages this cash make payment this is also very important this cash payment functioned like an interest bearing principal being advanced to a mortgager with uh, the landed assets uh, pledged as collateral meanwhile 
the genmam sale dates variously known in the regional vocabulary as atipattola karanam and viliyola karanam amounts uh, paid in the form of liquid money and was considered equal to the value of the so called current price near vila of the genmam plot however the deeds of permanent sale did not specify this is a general rule this is a general notion among the historians um, did not specify the exact amount of money that had been paid by an atipattola purchaser but interestingly dr p narayanan recently were successful in bringing out instances of atipero sale where the amount of or near near villa is mentioned from um, a grandavari rather an explored grandavari called tripunitara grandavari um, that means there were cases of uh, atipero transactions uh, by citing near villa exactly citing near villa in its in its in its legal uh, preview it was through this instances of sale that an existing landholder transferred his proprietorship and its reified birthright to an aspiring but moneyed purchaser territorial proliferation of title deeds also and also the expansion of what hs gramme once uh, called deep mortgages in the realm of genmam um, uh, proprietorship ran parallel to the fiscal and tenurial developments in the king's jerical domain some of the transactions of outright sale as uh, was observed by donald dar davis from the proprietary deeds of trikandiyur and venneri did mention the presence of and consent of a hindu overlordship in their legal preview but some others possibly the largest section amongst the non genmam sale deeds from the north malabar paper country of the early modern period do not acknowledge do not acknowledge this is my seventh argument do not acknowledge the presence knowledge and even the consent of any agencies other than those who directly take part or witness a take part take part in and witness a property transaction for instance out of the 178 land transactions listed in the chronicle crudali granthavari 47 documents um, uh, mention the outright sale of atipero they cover a long period between 1602 and 1786 and include instances of selling forest sweden tracts paramba gardens in the talasheri countryside the nambiar chiefs of kudali kudali kunnath household stayed subordinate at least in principle there are two arguments at least in principle to their uh, subordinate to their political overlords uh, um, the rajas of of of, of uh, of kotayam or the rajas of kolatnadu but none of the tipuru documents indicate a written consent here i quote uh, donald dar davis the written consent of overlords unquote which according to donald dar davis and also to the orientalist position of fw ellis was a common here i quote uh, davis again dharmic practice in late medieval kerala This non-reference to kingly political authority is more striking in the sale deeds that refer to a permanent transfer of fiscal rights such as patonu, melama, and chunkam, which had usually been collected by the kings or their revenue-collecting proxies. We also had some instances of the king and its political agents remaining absent even from the Atipuru deeds of a Shaivite. temple institution which figured central in david's findings on the influence of so called dharma shastra and its legal continuum along the malabar coast this is the shiva temple of palli manna very near to trikantiyu this is the shiva temple of palli manna at vadakancheri in the cochin territory the documents refer to the purchase of landed property in the years of 7040 and 7060 It was the samudayam or the manager of the temple the trustees named Attayu Raman who effected these outright land purchases and caused them to be added to the account of deity or the tevar of Palli Manna. If one studies such evidence, one cannot but recognize the possibility. This is my eighth argument. One, if one studies such evidence, one cannot but recognize the possibility of an emergent extra political preference in the titles and transfers of Attiperu assets. these economic transaction highlighted and ati- highlighted under the atipuru rubric appear more like inter party arrangements on value profession and user fraught and they do often remind us um, i acknowledge a suggestion from mahmud kuria my friend and they do remind us of the farul fiqh instructions on selling and buying as they found in the 16th century legal legal text such as fatul muin and also the kolla koduga discussion in some of the keralal pathi narratives kudali transactions therefore provide as a rare entry point to explore the landed atipur and its extra political nature more closely whether on an unreclaimed forest 
or on an n or on an enclosed paramba these instances of sale and purchases are money mediated arrangements with little reference to the permission of political authority of an appellate character more importantly they do not mention more importantly they do not mention any provisions and effects other than what had been found and remained in situ or stavaram or stable or immovable in the given plot of land in none of the atiparu deeds i that i examined include predial servants in their in their explicit tenurial provision this feature is also seen in a cochin atiparu deed of the year 1776 the deed names a marak the, the deed names a marakkai or muslim of the tamil lebbe denomination and a sephardi jew named simsol paradeshi both of them were residing in cochin in the coastal desam of kumbalangi the atiperu sale include 48 pieces of improvised wetland property comprising paddy flats nurseries riverside meadows water reservoirs and locks some of the plots were paramba gardens of coconut possibly reclaimed from the river and marshes of the cochin backwater where my friend justin may be able to uh, 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 speak about more how the coastal environment coastal ecology was transforming in this early modern period when the agrarian activities were encroaching upon the upon the transition uh, ecologies um um uh, and this uh, uh, some of the plots were coconut uh, 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 paramba possibly reclaimed from the river and marshes of cochin backwater however despite this artificial that is human made nature of these effects and their immediate environment and also the stock of labor that was um, concealed uh, or required for maintain concealed in this deed and required for maintenance that the, the transaction did not mention the presence either of a resident tenantry or of an existing provision for the supply of predial workman in its in its scope this omission was not um, uh, this omission of what is not stavaram uh, from the tipperu preview is at variance uh, with the standard model of labor deployment in the in the landed assets as proposed by erik j miller and several others uh, uh, who often conceived labor servitude labor servitude and by extension the culture of hindu caste that gives birth to it as a trans historical precondition for landed property development this is my ninth argument um uh, uh, they consider the mainstream historiography who which i called agrarianist often conceive the labor servitude um um and the culture of hindu caste that gives birth to it as a trans historical precondition for landed property development this preeminence of stavaram in the atiparu practice for which there are indeed multiple examples since the 18th century may compel us to argue uh, um in favor of an evolving pure landed fixation in the political economy and then if we as we, if we can accept this hypothesis that the emerging pure landed fixation in the political economy then if we can accept this hypothesis the contemporary atiperu achievers such as uh, simisol paradeshi of kumbalangi atayur raman of palli manna and the pappan poker of potara in kudali might have incurred higher startup cost and labor hire in case they initiated an agricultural invest, investment in their newly purchased property it is also probable that extreme forms of survey labor known as adima and its generalization during 18th and early 19th century um, uh, constituted an economic sequel to the atiparu development and shared and the adima often shared i i take clues from the uh, work of professor sanal mohan the shared the asset character of atiparu and this the, the instrument of adima seemed to have temporarily saved in court the atiparu owners that the resources from me being exhausted in an otherwise difficult process of commutation um, um it was this atiparu property with an inherent trait of privateness that carried along with it a, with it a class of agricultural laborers who enjoyed according to prasanna and parthasarathy no access to the titles in land and who remained in the province of malabar and kanara in particular bonded not only to the land perhaps more importantly uh, 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 to the person of the atiparu owner atiparu owner 
for an atipenu per owner the adima represented a specimen of his private asset which could be sold mortgaged and rented out by him independently of its land this private asset nature of adima is almost unheard of in the tamil mirasi region of the same era the landed assets along the poligari east coast according to an early examination of munro had in general retained their old corporate character because of the previous and because of the previous government's land tax demand had engrossed whatever little rent income was left with the coromandel land ownership the property in land bore no or little uh, sale value In the 18th century, Malabar Coast, on the other hand, presents a riddle of low state demand or the near absence of statist land tax. Here I quote Susan Bailey and 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 C. A. Bailey uh, 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 presents a riddle of low state demand coexisting with high socio economic stratification. Uh, Adima labor was positioned at the dispossessed bottom of this stratification, while the title of Attipuru and the access to land and rent income that it uh, entailed stood at the stood at the apex apike atiperu was central in determining the very design of economic stratification and therefore enjoyed a high monetary value in many cases several uh, in many cases several times this 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 monetary value was several times higher than its original purchase the value of land and the ambition to obtain title here i quote t l strange in one of his early reports uh, the value of land and the ambition of ambition to obtain titles here i quote in the uh, in the early modern uh, uh, history of property in malabar here i quote have been such that the tenures of most graduated and complex nature have been created establishing the claims so minute Uh, and extended in variety this was not withstanding recurrent episodes of political turmoil uncertainty and revenue oppression that affected the west coast during circa 16 1766 and 1792 and even after that any person as noted does noted alexander walker who has money to become the purchaser and the proprietor of a genmi estate this statement was seemingly true for the later half of of the late 18th century when the nidhi text kerala chithi ratnamala taxonomized the right of attiperu in five different classes of the attiperu varieties two classes that is kreyam and kalajam do not recognize any transactional requirements or rather transaction cost other than that of paying paying the appropriate money value and performing udagam or the most simple water right of water liberation i here i quote chithi ratnamala Whomsoever purchases land in Kerala after paying its due value with udagam right in land, udagam right is a landlord, and the go and the good people call him a genmi. We value, uh, uh, we see the same idea of landed ownership emerging uh, from the fr- from a public oath. which was taken in the year 17 um, uh, 73 by a luso indian merchant domingo rodriguez of talacheri he was employed as a chief translator of the uh, to the english east india company's commercial establishment the oath was documented before talacheri board and it was re- it was produced and it was uh, noted by ruchira banerjee in her in her wonderfully written phd and i take this long quote from the from rudila banerjee's phd and it is in the second uh, 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 second slide in my ppt presentation and um, the oath was documented before the talacheri board rodriguez swore before uh, uh, swore about the history of an outright property purchase sometime in the past his ancestor pedro rodriguez here i quote had bought land from brahman proprietors and despotic lords of kalai without any subjection nor he thought of paying anything to the king of the country the ground was bought by bit by bit and paying the value of plant for plant to the owner thereof as agreeable to the usual manner the proprietors were the lords of their estate as high as heaven above and as deep as the hell below with the same close and domination they transferred to pedro rodriguez the lordship of kalai without being obliged to obliged to any time to contribute even the slightest contribution to anybody domingo rodriguez was an important figure in north malabar politics during the mysore khuda dadi years he belonged to a family of dubashe interpreters which came to talacheri in the late 40s 
some of its elite some of the elite dubashes held influential portfolios in the 18th century politics and economy if we are ready to put aside the standard agrarianist prejudice about west coast land tenure for a moment and see rodriguez as an elite dubashe his property stake in ati peru world will not take us by surprise but at the same time um, um, other parvenu land holders were capable of creating uh, just an uh, such an effect mainly by their money uh, uh, by their by their by their known elite social origin the calicut tier head kallingal kunnira kunnikoru and the cochin adima the cochin slave or adima servant all akiri fall into this category kunnikoru belonged to the lobro panikar or haired man caste of tias who often took up always took up perhaps uh, the polluting profession of toddy drawing and distillation uh, but he owned here i quote uh, extensive assets of landed property uh, and had long been employed in company service here i quote robert rickards first as lisa rosner had recently identified as a menon or a clerk for major alexander worker and later as an intelligent native officer of revenue for francis buchanan Unquote. Kunyikoru was one of the key informants uh, to the principal collector or collector Robert Ricketts when the later drafted his famous scheme of asset assessment for the province of Malabar in eighteen ninety-three. Ricketts saw this individual wielding ownership rights over nineteen coconut gardens, all of them situated in the mafusel of Calicut. The landed property of Olakiri. Here I conclude. The landed property of Olakiri, the Cochin slave or Adima, is a bit more surprising. It is largely because of its Adima status, to which the Cochin Blue Book had paid an added attention. Um, um, now we have already offered a brief discussion of the instrument of Adima and its predial position in the Atipuru world. We also know that from the abolitionist uh, circles of English India Company, names of a few Adima men or men who who held the landed and revenue titles during the 19th century but it is from the documentation of all akiris purchase that we get perhaps full details perhaps for the first time of a landed opportunity obtained by an adima individual of the 18th century however all akiris deed discloses i believe more about the nature of atipur as an obtainable right than about his adima status i am more interested in in the in its implication of the nature of atiperu right of pre early modern times than as um, than on his adima status uh, it was it was in 1783 that the adima family of olakiri his rightful wife malati his son antoni and the dot and his daughter vilomina had purchased an atiperu plot of ownership in a place called mulavugad the uster in revenue circle of mulavugad was near uh, uh, to the port town of kochin and olakiri was an adima servant of a boat maker named lawrence boys Uh, but the piece of land that he bought was not vacant not a vacant sandy stretch indented in particular in the historiography of malabar slavery uh, uh, indented for a slave shack or chala instead it was a river front front plot plot of about 288 coal measures about 241 meters in length that contained undeniable evidences of uh, constant improvisation uh, improvisation and investment including the paramba garden yielding fry five fruits or panja phalam salt pan works uh, masonry houses and several well stored uh, store rooms or ara olakiri purchased this property from an already standing unit of ownership uh, from one lady lucinta and her husband and who here i got the document held this land as netum or or a pre existing freehold and therefore paid only a reduced tax or rajabhogam to the to the cochin sarkar despite the adima status of olakiri and the occasional title concessional title of the plot he had purchased uh, neither the prior consent of raja nor even the knowledge of its adima so called adima owner owner the boat maker lawrence boys were mentioned in the blue book entry rather the purchase document uh, the purchase document concludes with a statement which is similar to the provision uh, of privatized enjoyment in the talachiri dubashi's property purchase all akire here i quote 
this is my own translation all the kinds of atiperu and the prices for the standing masonry structures in two separate accounts the atiperu right was brought for the immediate benefit of the purchasers and also for the enjoyment of their legal heirs their nephews without any objection to anyone all these purchase and possession events are in agreement with walker's observations on the access to genman property it is highly probable that this bombay employees report on land tenure and transfer thereof uh, drew closely upon an existing procedural norm maybe his urban collaborators in malabar such as kalingal kunikoru were deeply familiar with it it was on this non state this ongoing procedural norm that munro ellis uh, consensus was uh, uh, fabricated here i conclude by saying that we started this presentation by describing a rare case of agreement between thomas munro and f w ellis these administrators represented rival parties implicated in an intense revenue policy debate in the presidency of madras we called this agreement the malabar consensus and showed that it was established upon an early 19th century realization about the institutionalized existence of individually owned and therefore freely alienable um a uh, uh, landed property along the west coast we explained how this consensus corresponds to an 18th century scenario of moneyed purchase money transactions in which uh, events of permanent land transfer especially the outright sale and purchase of assets bearing the title of malabar birthright were taking place these transaction underscored among other things an emergent if not a systematically unfolding private character of the regional landed assets we have seen frequent transfers in birthright property and the, uh, and then uh, emerge and the, and the emergent there from of a substantial class of parvenu land holders and of an equally significant social class made up of share croppers and wage earners who either been dispossessed from their previous titles or enjoyed little or limited access to land ownership which characterized i believe the malabar version of early modern experience and this parvenu janmams and the people who got dispossessed in the process of establishing parvenu janmam i believe was uh, represents malabar's version of early modern experience for munro and ellis and their and their early 19th century loyalist it was this parvenu aspect that differentiated malabar and also canara from its east to coast counterparts um it also help us to explain a possible reason for why the district of chingalpet and baramahal remained unsuccessful in court providing a common ground of ground for ground of agreement in the in the in the um, uh, 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 munro ellis debate once set in motion either by an event of uh, outright purchase or by a foreclosable mortgage the new ownership titles and even the monetary process through which they came into being embodied an extra political orientation they had their own modes of uh, modes of articulation thank you thank you very much dr abhirash professor michael tarvin sir would you like to add something before we take up the questions uh the audience are requested to please type in their queries in the chat box yeah bob uh, i would request uh, dr rachel to to uh, conduct a question answer session and at the end i would uh, um I, if the time permits, give one or two points of, uh, for discussion. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, I request uh, we have not uh, yet received any queries. I request those who have comments or queries to please type in. So Join. shall we wait for the queries to come? There it is. If there's a gap, uh, yeah, yes, sir. Please, please, could you? Can I ask a very, very, very general question? Uh, what about the pre-Mandro period? Uh, you know, Mandro's uh, position is, uh, is very clearly explained. 
but just before that, what what was happening to the same region? I mean, uh, this I said this is a almost a generalized general general question, I mean, not exactly a specific one. You know. Dr. Abhilash? Uh, it seems to be, sound seems to be muted. I can't... Uh, Abhilash, your voice is muted. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, thanks a lot for the question, though it seems uh, seems like a general question. I, am, I, I don't know whether I may be able to uh, answer it satisfactorily. And one of the... Um, I think Monroe, uh, uh, though he was he he came to West Coast in 18, 1800, and he was there a couple of years in South Canada, and 1802, 1801, or 1802. I'm not specific about the dates, uh, clear about the dates. And he was transferred to Bara Mahal. He he actually ran away from South Canada and went to Bara Mahal and see the district, and he came back in in 1870. Uh, and what Munro, if you look at um, his early correspondence when he was in, he was traveling, touring um, um, South Canada, uh, the Skasar Code and Mangalavaram region, and he, he was reflecting, his reflections on the revenue history of region was based on a huge number of documents which he, which he called as Rekha, uh, which, was, uh, which was collected from the riots the elusive riots of that region, South Canada, and part of North Malabar, who used to meet him because he was a settlement officer in group and individually, or in huge uh, uh, mob, uh, uh, used to come to his tent and deposit this 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 documentations. And some of them dates back to the Nayaka period. Some of them date back to the Sadashiva Nayaka period. And this Rekha, or the so-called black books of Katatas of South Canada, uh, contain uh, a, a localized uh, long history of proprietorship and and its negotiation with with different statist uh, institutions. So the point that I would like to make, though Monroe was writing or reflecting upon the, this issue, he was reflecting upon at least a short history which dates back to the early early early. Um, uh, 18th century, and I and and I I, I believe I I'll, I'll, I'll suggest I I, I I I have one small argument to make. I believe that uh, at least in the northern part of uh, Mal Malabar, um, uh, if you look at the Paimasi documentation, the proprietorship was so articulated in its uh, historical and uh, political manifestation that the, a condensi, condensating state or a centralizing state was not able to compete with, uh, with this uh, well-articulated little proprietors. And uh, uh, it was this little uh, landed interest uh, in the countryside which made a carpet state like uh, Travancore impossible. And I am arguing quite uh, diametrically against uh, the, the argument which uh, uh, forwarded by Dr. Kane Ganesh. It was, it was not the lack of uh, necessary dynamism in the landed property, uh, property realm that made state impossible in Malabar, but it was the, it was the, it was a well articulated property interest in the countryside. Um, if I borrow from Brian J. Morton, the key people in the countryside, the Goda of Frankfurt in the countryside, or the, or the, or the property class in the entrance property class in the countryside made uh, the statist uh, carpet, uh, the carpet states impossible in Malabar. And I, I, I think that uh, as a response, direct response to Professor Michael Taragansar's answer, I believe that at least by the 17th century, you have a, 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 a systemic manifestation uh, across this northern agrarian countryside of uh, well-articulated agrarian proprietors and who were even uh, who were who were positioning themselves as against all the century pitel uh, attempts by the by the state whether it's from Kolatu Nadu kings or from the Samarin or from any other uh, other other region they were they were pitting themselves against the century uh, pitel attempts from the huge political institutions and one of the one of the symptoms one of the evidence probably one of the evidences for this 
this countryside positioning was that if you look at the look at the primacy if you look at the jamabandi reports of ashad bey khan and the malabar was a place compared to the mysore mysore regions uh, balaghat regions or the carnatic regions malabar was a place of tax evasion the, the, or, or, though the, the the state the kudata the state was able to enumerate its revenue potential perhaps in a perfect manner uh, if you look at the uh, jamabandi schedule of ashad bey khan reproduced in the second malabar commission 70 percentage of its assets were untaxed and uh, the number of you, you you may see the number of uh, uh, of uh, coconut trees the number of uh, pepper vines and the number of jack trees and the number of arecanut palms but despite uh, their ability their success in enumerating these assets the, the the ability to tax the number of trees which were enumerated as tax was about 30 percentage and this is like this is an unusual tax evasion i believe one of the reasons behind this tax evasion was that the landed property interest in the countryside was so entrenched and i believe i i, I believe i don't know whether i am making sense this is a classical contradiction between private property and state okay Okay, very very interesting argument. I will put it uh, subsequently, but I would I would like the discussion to go on. Other questions could be could be entertained, and we could uh, respond. You could respond to them. Thank uh, you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have a query by uh, Dr. Jay Prakash Raghavaya. Was there at least a theoretical possibility of being a Jenmi? without land in malabar as some administrators stated <laughs> and uh, i think i think if you look at if you look at the uh, uh, you have Lo we have logan commission or the malabar land uh, tenure commission in 18 or 1881 and 1882 and uh, immediately after logan commission has submitted its report and uh, there was uh, there was a the, the madras administration has established um, a series of uh, consultation bodies to discuss uh, uh, the the suggestions and or even even bypass the the logan committee report and if you look at this tenurial committee reports of the late 19th century if you look at the dispositions given by different participants in that uh, committees i believe i have seen is a couple of instances in which uh, uh, there were there were jenmis who, who who had no effective control on their land because they were indebted and i think that this 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 indebted jenmi and and the indebted jenmi was an early modern phenomenon and uh, i have hinted in my presentation and i have discussed this detail extensively not extensively at my limited ability in my phd dissertation that the 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 the, the rental ability of uh, rent taking or rent seeking ability of uh, a section of jenmis in, in north malabar at, at least in north malabar was severely uh, truncated by another developer So this is because of a peculiar tenurial arrangement in North Malabar or in Malabar in general. That if you have this mortgagee uh, uh, tenants, that is Karnamdar. Once the Karnamdar don't think, like I'm talking about this early 19th century, not uh, after the 1860s or not not. But, not about the second half of the 19th century. At least uh, before the legal and uh, governmental interventions in re redefining both Karnam and Jenmum. Before that, that that era, before 1836, as per Devinder Gobinath, so you you the the mortgagee mortgagee uh, tenants uh, were often working as mortgagee capitalists because the the money that they advanced to the landlord, the kanartham, and uh, was considered uh, as a credit, and the interest of this money is often uh, uh, deducted from the rent that was supposed to go to the go to the uh, landlord and you have uh, different stages of uh, uh, tenurial uh, uh, different types of tenurial allocation on the basis of the amount of money that you advance to a jenny and uh, in the in the in, in a situation which which now we call as ot and uh, kaibudochi um, and uh, nirmudal and from ot onwards the partum is equal to um, equal to the interest the interest is equal to the partum that you pay to the jenny so there is no part term if there is no part term then me then me it's 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 no more agenda i believe the economic prerogative of the jenmi 
presence uh, was severely truncated by the advancing mechanism, money advances, or the mechanism of money advances, which were integral to the tenurial uh, system uh, of uh, Malabar. And, uh, uh, and, and this perhaps made uh, the Genmi, uh, and if you consider this as a valid hypothesis, and then this Genmi without a land is possible. Genmi became a mere title that, like an empty title, if uh, kings can become, make their crown hollow, if, if there are hollow crowns, and you can also find hollow, hollow genmis, the uh, genmis with a bare empty title. I, 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 I think that that was a possibility, uh, at least uh, 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 most effectively in the later half of the 19th century. So, so, and and the interest-bearing money used to eat up the genmi prerogative. And the genmi that we see uh, in the late 19th century, I believe, was a recent phenomenon. And there are scholars who argue that the genmi date back to the to the Tarawada date back to the Chera period. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not an expert on that kind of investigation. Uh, Thank you. Uh, we have the next query from Dr. Dinesh Vadakinil. Thank you very much, Dr. Malayan, for a thought-provoking talk. I have a rather unimportant question. I'm also afraid whether I misread you. The question is, what should have forced the 18th century landowners to sell their genmum land accepting money? Was such sale solely because of some economic course? Or had that to do something with aspects other than economic? Um. <laughs> Would you like me to uh, read it out again, or you know, I, I'm reading it, Rachel. I I, okay. just, I can I can see the question, okay. and then and um, uh, this is a question which uh, is it's it's I don't know I don't know how to answer this. I um uh, uh, I think this this uh, transactions. Uh, it is. Uh, I don't say that. Uh, I don't consume that. There's an argument that this, uh, 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 this genmis or the landed um, uh, uh, groups, both the kings and the uh, and the upper caste uh, Nambudri Brahmins who were holding this land as the genmum, were leading a life which is uh, which is uh, just known for their uh, consumption, the conspicuous consumption, and which is un which is unproductive, and because of their uh, actually embedded. Uh, ritually driven um, um, la expenses, uh, which is which is not productive at all, they became bankrupt. This is an argument. This is a, a group of scholars used to used to make this argument, uh, but I don't think um, the, the the fact that people were transacting their genmum rights. I don't know why they transacted their genmum rights and what was the reason behind these transactions. Of course, those who were just buying this land, those who were purchasing these lands where where we can actually see, we can actually uh, the motivational uh, part motivational uh, agenda on part of the land buyers that is that i suppose is uh, 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 could be uh, could be identified easily but why uh, somebody is selling his land uh, why somebody is selling this land um, i don't know it, it may not be uh, there are economic reasons but um, i I'm, I'm not there to suggest a sole economic reason behind this selling enterprise and uh, um, 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 I, I don't know. I am. I, am, uh, I think uh, there are aspects uh, uh, which are which are extra economic in this in this uh, in this whole affair of people, um, uh, mostly the Genmis leaving their land. I, I, I don't know. I never paid attention to this uh, this aspect, which I think I should be able to pay enough attention in, in a due course of time. Um, uh, people were in need of money, I, I, I believe. One of the reasons, going back to this old economic argument, uh, all of them were in need of money because this, as I mentioned in my, provisionally mentioned in my hypothesis, in, in my presentation as a hypothesis, that the, the, there was a structural uh, uh, necessity, uh, 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 the structural necessity to, uh, uh, which made people to uh, look for money, and the money it seems was uh, integral to their to their subsistence. And if something is integral to their subsistence, 
and i believe people people live for money and this whole if i if the mahmud uh, if my if i if my if i read mahmud correctly and he make an interesting argument that this whole um, other worldliness uh, the other worldliness in the late uh, early modern bhakti poets um, um, it's it's a something to do uh, with which was actually drafted as a critique cultural critique of people who are transacted with money and um, yeah i think i have been answered properly but uh, thanks for thanks dinesh and marsh this is a this is an important question that make me more responsible and that i would certainly look into in more details thank you uh, our next query is again from dr jay prakash rakhwaya in malaba during the latter half of the 19th century it was kanam that emerged as a marketable tenure not janma so um, uh, yeah how do you respond to this i i because it's my my research was was mainly on the 18th century and as and um, later i stopped my uh, i i basically focus on the company rule i am not much interested i i haven't paid much attention to the to the second half of the 19th century the second half of the 19th century uh, there is an all this is an altogether different scenario and and i believe that most of the economic historians i uh, especially those who wrote about malabar they have looked into the to the early phases of 19th century and the and the late phase of the 18th century uh, with an eye which was stuck on the later half of 19th century and the early half of 20th century so um, i think this uh, this later half of um, 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 uh, of um, later half of 20th century you need a bit more Uh, uh, a bit more expertise, a special expertise, and I am I'm I'm not competent enough to make a comment on the late 18th century, uh, late 19th century phenomenon. Uh, and 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 of course, people were selling Karnam and Janmam, but I believe that in the by the mid 19th century, uh, both Karnam and Janmam uh, were were drastically redrafted, and this 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 the process of redrafting was not um, conspired in Britain, but the But the but, but entirely in Britain, I, I believe this 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 process of redrafting was happened in Calicut, in Kannur, in in if you look at the if you look at the numerous uh, endless uh, records of deeds uh, which were kept in the Calicut uh, archives. So there were people who were who were who were fighting for their landed rights, and um, so I, I don't know. I, I I'm not sure about what happened after the. after the later half of 18th century my my studies are basically on the first half of 18th century which i believe was uh, scholars mainly uh, don speak much about especially for malaba we have a second query from dr ganeshan vadakane from your talk what i learned is that individuals are buying land hmm. whereas in the pre modern period property seems to be owned not by individual but by a taravad a kind of collective ownership do you think that individualism as a value was emerging in malabar in the 18th century independent of colonial contact well, i think so thanks for this question i think so because if you if you um, and not only in malabar but if you look at uh, even in for, for malabar if you look at um, um, uh, look at a set of songs normally called as northern ballads And, and and there is an internal tendency uh, for avankuli side killing one's own uncle and if you look at move out to mallan kadha move out to mallan kadha the central theme revolves around um, a competition with one's own avankular uh, elders so i believe that uh, the the so called taravada that we see as a compact institution by the by the just before the demolition and the in the mid 19th century was a was a votive structure which was internally ridden with conflicts um, and i believe that this is this a this a in early modern possibility of uh, non collective assertions uh, in which uh, one of the contours were certainly individual and um, this is there's a possibility of investing um, such a such a such a such a moment in the 18th century history and uh, uh, 
even in the tarawad even in the jointly owned property and um, uh, we 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 have evidences uh, uh, at least cursory evidences um, of uh, uh, uncle of the karanavas uh, buying land for their own their own their own their own offsprings they also buy land for they also give out land and their 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 assets for their nephews uh, but uh, they were they were not uh, they were occasionally uh, uh, instances of uh, this avankular heads uh, uh, bequeathing their their assets to their to their to their to their offsprings and uh, this nephew and uncle uh, uh, was uh, was a contender within every uh, most of the tarawads the conflict was structured around this uh, nephew and 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 sons so this is the primary idea that i get from from the uh, from the uh, from the land transaction and also from the contemporary records of this period but um, but uh, this ownership uh, uh, though it came to be it has it has it has a dimension uh, uh, of uh, it has uh, uh, see even in the kerolpatti you have egotakam and simultaneously you have kerolpattis which talks about binotakam and if ekotakam if ekotakam is a corporate holding where well, you have evidences you have instances other versions referring to binotakam which is not which is not non corporate which is not which is non corporate so i i i believe that this 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 individual ownership and the individualism and we have already a standing historiography about the eastern coast of india where people started uh, thinking about uh, pre modern authors pre modern authorship pre modern selves and i believe that is a possibility to be investigated along the coast of malabar i don't know whether i i answered correctly but this is my cursory unorganized and impromptu responses thank you dr abhilash uh, professor michael taragan would you like to take the discussion forward we don't have any more queries in the chat box I request all of you to please wait for a moment. I believe the connection at Professor Michael Taragan's end has been lost. Uh, however, I think he'll be back online in a minute or so. Meanwhile, if any of you have any further comments or queries, I request you to please type those. Uh, we have a further query by Dr. Dinesh Varakini. Would you call these 18th century developments as the part of the process of emergence of capitalism from within? I, um, I, I, I often read. Um, uh, I'm a big like I don't know. Uh, uh, I used to read David Lagan a lot. and um, 
he has an interesting idea along with Frank Perlin uh, and Bertha Stein of his late years um, that the South Asia, uh, at least the Tirunelveli region that he was focusing on, um, uh, it 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 has a peculiar development started from within, um, for which which he calls agrarian capitalism. Um, uh, I think if we, um, uh, I don't know how to how to theorize it, how to theorize it, but the initial impression that I received. Um, or the initial scenario that became manifested before me when I look at this eight, late 18th century documentation on production on labor process was that uh, uh, the, if, if, if capitalism is an economic experience, is a capitalism as a systemic economic experience of intensifying production and also um, uh, uh, if you agree that capitalism is a, is a, is a it's a regime of exploitation, which is uh, uh, which uh, which makes uh, uh, labor uh, or the people uh, uh, labor dispossessed of uh, his uh, proximity to the means of production, and uh, I, I believe that in terms of indexes from production, in terms of indexes from 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 labor process. I believe that uh, Malabar, we may not be wrong in theorizing um, uh, an, uh, an aspect of agrarian capitalism in the, in the, in the Malabar countryside. And uh, capitalism is not always uh, urbanization and in, in industrialization. And there's a non urban, um, there's a non urban and the non industrial uh, uh, facet of uh, capitalism it's it's it, it is it is a peculiar technique if you it's a peculiar technique and a peculiar taxonomy and if you see it as a, a peculiar technique of exploitation peculiar technique of intensifying production by exploiting labor uh, and and i believe uh, 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 there's a possibility uh, why not if 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 uh, tirunelveli and if mysore if if you look at neeraj hadekar's work recent work if you look at the northern northern maratha southern maratha country uh, the, the places such as kongan northern kongan and southern maratha country there, there, there's a valid argument from scholars like neeraj hadekar um, uh, uh, david laddan and for mysore sashi shivaram krishna and uh, People, the, the new type of scholars, empirically sound uh, scholars, on the basis of evidences, they are trying to argue that if you agree that the capitalism is a peculiar type of intensification in, 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 in production, it's a peculiar type of dispossessing people of their of their labor, and uh, it seems that um, that. And, and and for this purpose, I think there's a precondition for it. There's a precondition for it, and we should understand. We should agree the first and primary, the onam pramana. I believe that we should understand that this. We should agree with the the fact that uh, the agricultural products that were produced in Malabar, be it pepper, be it um, be it cardamom, we should agree uh, at first that these were not produced in forest. Once see once we see that these are produced by human labor. These are the effects of human labor. Then we will be able to see uh, or able to able to conceive the whole political economy in a different different manner. And I I believe and and I believe uh, uh, there's a non-urban there's a non-industrial phase of capitalism uh, in the world. Um, and and I, uh, I I I I think so. But thanks for this question. Uh, the and Marsha, and, and I think I, I I answered it in my own ways of idiosyncrasies. Professor Michael Terrigan, sir, would you like yeah. to make the discussion uh, forward? Yeah, I would uh, like to raise two points. You know, um, one is, of course, it has been discussed the, um, in the questions that were asked. Um, see, part of your uh, conversation I could not follow because for a short while the internet was gone uh, down and I could not follow what was being spoken about. But uh, I, uh, so I hope I'm not repeating what has been already been said. You said about this um, uh, people owning genmum wanting to transact their genmum right. Uh, why? Why did they do it? Um, 
you know, I have, I have no theoretical, analytical uh, uh, point to make, but I've got certain empirical points to make because I've been working on uh, similar documents, uh, family documents uh, from central Kerala, um, uh, roughly corresponding to the Trishur, Aranakulam, uh, Kotem, and present day Alipi districts. What you find is that uh, number of well known, you know, uh, big families, big families, I'm using it in the common sensical word, families with large uh, holdings and large uh, uh, of the earlier period, uh, going practically bankrupt uh, during the early 19th century. And there's a new group emerging, uh, uh, practically buying up all the Kanam uh, tenancies and becoming very rich in the sense that they control quite a if you look at it uh, again, I'm not statistically very, uh, very sure to say that majority of them come from this kind of background, but a significant number of them come from some trading uh, and the Alipi uh, region and uh, uh, Kotem region, the trading of interest are not necessarily pure traders as we would understand that. But they are also partly cash crop cultivators. They were culti they're cultivating coconut. They are cultivating to some extent in certain region arachnid. Uh, certain region. Uh, they also produce paddy for the market. And mind you, this was happening in early 18th century, uh, early 19th century. So I'm saying that a group of commercially oriented. That is why I think. Um, in fact, my academic mentor, Professor K. N. Raj, very strongly insisted that there is a uh, importance in categorizing uh, agriculturists into cash crop cultivators and commercial cultivators. These are, you know, two different categories of people. Sometimes they may be joining together. The functions may be joining together, uh, but this. Um, so cash crop cultivation and cash crop uh, uh, sales, mm -hmm. uh, cash crop uh, export, were taken over by a group of people who, who come perhaps from the middle of the uh, community or caste structure that we had. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I would cite a, a very uh, interesting uh, example from Alipi district. There was a very, uh, very, very powerful uh, Nambudri family uh, near the coastal Alipi. Um, uh, at one time, some of the records which I have been looking at described their the letters from the from the family head as Tiruvelu. You know, they, they referred to as uh, Tiruvelu means it has got respected at the highest level. But that family. Uh, now you don't hear about them, they're, they're no more there. Uh, even I checked through the Yoga Sharma Sabha records, they're not there. Yeah. Now, uh, I, finally I realized that they've been becoming, now there's an LL family with the same name. So they, they got you know, turned into LL family. You know the normal case or not. Yeah. You know, Nambuzi family with no uh, you know, successors either uh, being forced to hand over their properties to 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 another family, and and uh, so the, if if it can happen in the matter of say sixty to seventy years, then that has to be investigated and that, and who benefits from it? It has been benefited from a, a group of people who were basically coconut traders and who, who made money. Okay. Same pattern seems to be seen in a significant. Uh, so I'm only saying that you know, uh, probably there was an um, economic reason. You know, people wanted to live well, and you know, uh, this is a time when bungalows became a yeah. became a common instead of living. Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. That's when Matu Tarayan built built his first bungalow. That's the first yeah. person. I mean, 
uh, in, in uh, late 18th century and people yeah. follow that. So this kind of, uh, Bangalore requires, you know, um, uh, chandeliers, carpets yeah. and all that, you know, you have to import it from Persia and all that. So big families go, go into economic problems and uh, this Khanam uh, uh, rights are bought by the yeah. uh, second uh, point which I, I mean this only of course uh, an illustration I would also like to make um, is that the you know the way in which um, the uh, commercialization happened uh, in at least in central uh, Kerala uh, was uh, cutting across uh, even the earlier feudal social barriers. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I'm getting evidences that uh, uh, the Perimpada Mupin, uh, that is the uh, Kochim Daja, yeah. Perimpada Mupin uh, becomes a contender with others while yeah. he is the king of, uh, he is ruling as uh, uh, not, a, not a minor state, he was ruling a major, important yeah. state. Uh, yeah. and, and, and there are a um, number of people who belongs to the Christian community, people who belong to the Muslim community, yeah. who are uh, bidding with him uh, for, for, you know, and he is also forced to sell his properties. Yeah. So if it yeah. can happen at that stage, then yeah. that means it, it requires a certain kind of, uh, in, uh, certain kind of analytical finesse to, yeah. you know, uh, which seems to be uh, not in uh, exercise that much. In our, I mean, I'm sure that work like yours would be would add to it, and you know, I, I only wanted to point out these two. two yeah. Thank you. A very good presentation, and we are very, very happy that you you yeah. shared your views with this group. Um, we hope we'll get other chances when we can discuss it in greater detail. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Dr. Abhinash, would you like to add I'll on? I just add, a, just add a small small comment, mm -hmm. and I'm very happy to hear this this Karnam moment. Uh, mm -hmm. Prof. Michael Kadagan describing this extended Karnam moment from central central mm -hmm. central Kerala, and this is very important because if you look at uh, the definition of Karnam that was given in Gundat and Bailey, mm -hmm. uh, you feel that these people were discussing two different and entirely unconnected things. And uh, I, I believe that with the emergence of a centralizing state in Travancore, and uh, the, 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 there was an attempt from the state to to redefine or not redefine to 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 mile down the the Karnam moment or the Karnam development. Um, uh, and uh, but in Gundert, uh, you see this uh, this whole potential of Karnam, and uh, he and this whole potential of Karnam, I believe, is exactly the one that uh, Professor Michael Taragan was speaking about. And I believe that this, uh, this, this a structural contradiction between um, the, the, this Rand and um, Partam and Palisha. And the Palisha is the Palisha of the money that is advanced as Kanam, that is Kanartham. And, and, uh, and the uh, Partam is Jenmi Partam or the Partam uh, which is claimed by a landlord. And what happened when the when the Kanam is it's appearing as a rampant phenomena or or multiplying itself as a secular phenomena, the partum gets reduced, and the, as the interest of the money which is advanced, the interest of the money capital is spreading across the agrarian territories. What what is getting de-strengthened um, uh, or sidelined is the partum, and the sidelining of partum uh, it's, it's it's also the sidelining of rent-seeking behavior. And you feel you you can see endless cases, endless cases. Oh my God, endless cases from different parts of Kerala, especially from the. I, I believe it was. I, I initially thought that it was a North Malabar phenomenon, but I, 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 I when Michael Taragan sir spoke about the Central Kerala and the Southern Kerala phenomenon, I believe that uh, we should we should look into these areas too. This is a regional phenomenon. I, I believe hundreds of families, uh, the rent seeker families getting displaced by this new group who are enterprising with the speculative money capital and this is because of this fact that this uh, tenurial committees uh, tenurial investigation committees of the late 19th century varana court illam nambudiripadu 
yes. and he was a member of this neural committee when he wanted to describe this kanam holders of his varanakottilam nambudri varanakottilam was a huge land land owner and uh, they people say that uh, from chandragiri river to the to the valavattanam river the whole land belongs to the janma and he was such an influential uh, land holder he uh, uh, he referred to them as not as they, he he said that they are not tenants they are mortgagee capitalists they are mortgagee yeah. capitalists because the the burden of part term is not attached to them. Uh, if i may if i may intervene uh, i would also point out that you know in southern kerala it's not the word term kanam that is being used it's yeah. basically oti Oti, oti is the term that was used. Yeah. So, oti. Uh, ah, more, moreover, it is more or less the the kanam kind of kind of a transaction. Yeah. But what I'm trying to say is that those people who buy up these kanams, they are also willing to buy up even the varam patam. Yeah. 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 Or, ordinary, uh, you know, patams yeah. are also taken up by these people. They yeah. literally absorbs it in uh, as if they were hungry yeah. people or something like yeah. that, hungry yeah. for land. and yeah. they build their fortunes around uh, uh, these kind of transaction and yeah. most of the land is deployed to to be to be cultivated with uh, coconut and yeah. um, uh, yeah. and other cash crops I mean, yeah 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 that seems to be the, the pattern absolutely <laughs> absolutely <laughs> yeah. I, 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 yeah thanks a lot thanks a lot and i completely agree with and it's like it's like it's like opening me a new area of a new field of uh, investigation which is not uh, immediate which was not immediate i haven't seen documents from the southern and central kerala yeah. i think uh, i would well, be able to well, why, why don't i make a suggestion yeah please please do initiatives with uh, people like uh, dr rachel valgis and and others in the kchr and we will uh, organize a seminar on um, uh, documents which has been studied all over kerala and then jayprakash can yeah. talk about yeah please uh, real uh, um, um, uh, uh, south kerala uh, yeah. and yeah. we will have a we will have a comparison of of, of experiences or uh, what we find from the documents but it should not be purely based on documents alone it should also be something yeah. which is you know more Um, yeah. Based upon experiences and all that, yeah. so I, I think that is that is worth being uh, pursued. Yeah, uh, or, you know, we can we can plan it for the next one year uh, uh, for the 2002 or something, yeah. and, and, and try to do that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And I thank Dr. Jack Prakash Chakravarty, Dr. Dinesh and Vadakinin, and uh, all of them who with great passion. I, I hope I didn't I didn't repeat what Dinesh was saying. he was also implying this kind of kind of a transaction so yeah. I'm, i'm sorry yeah. um, professor michael karan so shall we bring the program to a conclusion yeah yeah, yeah. um thank you very much dr abhilash malel for that very engaging uh, talk and the very lively discussion um as professor michael karan suggested we be Uh, we hope that we can carry forward this interactions uh, through different ways uh, i thank all the participants for being present here and for your queries uh, once again i want to announce once again our next webinar which is on december 10th by dr mahmood kuria on matrilineal ocean multiple histories of marimakkatayam in the indian ocean Uh, thank you dr abhilash dr michael karagan and all the participants thank you thank you sir thank you